Well, good morning, Walden Church. It's so good to have you here this morning. It's good to have you watching online. I want to start this week off with a story. There is a story about two brothers who had terrorized the small town where they lived for decades. They were unfaithful to their wives. They were abusive to their children. They were dishonest in business. They were loud. They were boisterous. They were just plain rude to everyone. One day, out of the blue, the younger brother passed away. He died. The older brother went to the local church. He goes up to the pastor and he says, Pastor, I want you to conduct my brother's funeral. And it's important to me that during the service, you paint him out to be a saint. The preacher said, I can't do that. I can't. We both know that he was far from that. The older brother pulled out his checkbook and said, Preacher, I'm prepared to give you $100,000 to this church. And all I'm asking is that you publicly say from the pulpit that my brother was a saint. On the day of the funeral, the preacher began his sermon this way. Everyone here knows that the deceased was a wicked man, a womanizer, a drunk. He terrorized his employees. He cheated on his taxes. And the preacher paused a moment. And then he said, but as evil and sinful as this man was, compared to his older brother, he was a saint. <laughs> Romans 1, 7, Paul's addressing his letter to the Roman church. And he says, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. In 1 Corinthians 1, 2, Paul addressed the Corinthians to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul uses the word saint both times. It must have been one of his very favorite words because he uses it to describe Christians. In fact, he uses it over 60 times in his letters, which is surprising when you realize that he never once calls them Christians. And yet saint is not a word that we use in church today. I've never heard anyone say, yeah, my wife and I are having a few saints over to the house for dinner. No one ever says, my lawyer is a saint. When Paul talks about the disciples, his favorite word is saints. He calls the true disciples of Christ by this word, saints, or the holy ones, or the holy people of God. The word saint, or the word holy, is the word hagios in Greek, and it just means set apart one, or holy one. And there are three other words used for holiness, all of which are almost exclusively used by Paul, which means what? Which means Paul is profoundly concerned with holiness. He has a burning passion for holiness. But that's not how we think of the word saint today. The Catholic Church has turned its meaning into a very devout Christian who has died, and they've been canonized later by a pastoral council. And then we refer to them as St. Peter, St. Augustine, St. Patrick, but when you read the Bible, according to Scripture, every Christian, whether well-known, unknown, leader, follower, every Christian is a saint. In the biblical sense, the most obscure, unknown Christian is just as much a saint as the Apostle Paul. And so if you're a Christian and you're watching this morning, that means you've been called to be a saint. And over the next couple of weeks, I want to examine what that means. What it means to be a Christian, a disciple, by the things we do. I think that's where we're going to focus. Because I think in church, we spend ample time talking about what we believe. We preach, we study theology, but where does all that head knowledge become praxis? Where does it hit the streets? 
and becomes action? Where does it turn into practice and the things that we do? Because Jesus' own parting words to the disciples, the night of the Lord's Supper, communion that we celebrated last week, Jesus says to his disciples, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And then he says, watch this, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By what? By Jesus' command to love. Not from head knowledge, not from Bible study. It's not whether or not you go to church. It's not who you vote for. It's not one translation of the Bible that's better or the other. It's love. God expects us to be loving. Ephesians 4 says, rather speak the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. God expects this. He expects us to be growing. God expects us to be saints in love. Romans 1 says to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. You and I, this is our calling. It is our calling. So for the next four weeks, we're going to be examining different areas of sainthood, discipleship, spiritual growth. This is kickoff week. Our kids have gone back to school, and so if they have to buckle down, if they have to think, if they have to hit the books, then we should too. So today we're going to talk about integrity and our personal holiness. We'll be looking at our character. Next week we'll examine generosity and how we invest in God's kingdom. Our third week we'll be talking about a servant's heart. And our last week together, we'll be talking about courage and commitment and leadership. And as we start right here, I want to I take a call back to the time when we were examining the Pharisees. When we were studying the seven woes, we said that the Pharisees were Jesus' opponents. Ultimately, they were the ones who conspired with the Jewish ruling council to have Jesus killed. And it seems from the outside that Jesus got along with everyone, right? He loved everyone. He hung out with tax collectors. He hung out with people caught in sexual sin. So his beef was never with sinners. You know, in the church today, whenever I hear Christians criticize other Christians, other pastors, authors, speakers, we throw the word heretic around a lot. Oh, you read her books. Well, I heard she was a heretic. People seem to take it upon themselves to determine who is and who is not a heretic. And often enough, we use this word very carelessly. But as we see with the Pharisees, Jesus' focus was on hypocrisy more than heresy. Jesus was opposed to people who were fake, who lacked integrity, people who were going through the motions, people who were one way on the outside and they were another way on the inside. Jesus wanted his followers to be real, they could be broken, they could be sinful, they could be dirty. They could have the wrong job. They could be people who messed up their past, made mistakes. They could be blue-collar workers, they could be poor, but they had to be real. Church, this is our first act, our first thought. As people who are called to be saints, we should be people of integrity. That means as a church, we resist duplicity. We resist falsehood and facades and hypocritical action. We should be people of our word. We should be people who are whole. People who are Christians are honest, right? And, and, and we are the ones that are called to be saints. 
And that should be anywhere we go. Not just church, right? Are you a saint at work? Are you a saint at the grocery store? Are you a saint with that unattentive, forgetful waiter? If we're to be people who have integrity, that means that this honesty that we live with has to permeate every single aspect of our life. If you demand that your employees are loyal to your business, if you have your employees sign a non-compete, if you value the loyalty of your customers, then you can't at the same time be a person who is faithless in your marriage. A hypocrite is an actor. That person wears a mask. That person has two faces. They live two lives. They have two different personalities. What would make somebody be like this? Why, why would somebody live two different lives? Why be two different ways? Most likely, perception, right? Take the Pharisees, for example. Jesus said in Matthew 23, they do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. They wanted the prestige of it all. They wanted the fame. They wanted the handshakes. They wanted the smile. They wanted the business contacts. They wanted the best seat at dinner. But the thing about being an actor, the thing about being a hypocrite is one of you is fake. One of you is wearing a mask. And the other person is the real you. And the problem with too many saints is all too often, it's the church version of you that is the mask. This is why Jesus went after the Pharisees, because it was the holy part of them, the saint version of them that was fake. Look, it's okay to try something and to fail. It's okay to admit, you know what? I'm not quite there yet. It's okay to be imperfect. And it's okay to admit that. To say, look, I'm not perfect. In fact, that's better. That's preferred. We should strive for transparency and realness with each other. To say, you fall down, you know what? I do too. To say, hey, that's funny, you don't know where that is in the Bible? <laughs> I, don't, I don't either. But it's when we put on the mask and we try to appear to be somebody that we're not, that's when we start to steer off course. It happens with the Pharisees. What about with the early church? What about after Jesus left? Did hypocrisy happen in the early church? Yes, it happened in a big way. We're gonna look at that story today and it's in Acts chapter four and five. Acts chapter four finishes, now the full number of those who believed, now this would be the early church, were of one heart and soul and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. This was communal living. People were doing life together. And to do life together, to have it be successful, you have to be open, you have to be genuine, you have to be transparent. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostle Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, he sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Wow. Wow, what a great thing that Barnabas did. And, and others were doing, right, as we read. Can you imagine? Because he doesn't will it to the church. 
which is what some people do, right? He, he, you know, he didn't say, you know, let me enjoy my wealth for a while. Let me enjoy my wealth while I'm still alive. And then after I die, I'll give my money to the church. No, he does it while he's still alive. I'm sure that got a great reaction. He might have tried to do it privately, right? But even when you do something in private, word gets around and people start saying, hey, did you hear what Barnabas did? Oh my goodness, he sold his field and he gave 100% of the money to the church. What a good guy Barnabas is. You know, I, I know his mother, good upbringing, good family. And I'm sure for Barnabas, it felt good. It feels good to do good. It feels good to do a good thing. So what if I'm on the outside looking in? Maybe I wanna get in to this church, break in, put my foot in the door, maybe get some people to start to notice me. Sure looks nice to get all that praise, to get all those good job slaps on the back. I'd like some of that. You know, maybe if I do a good thing, maybe if I do what he did, ride his coattails, maybe I'll get the same praise. Turn the page. Next chapter, Acts 5. But a man named Ananias, his name means God is good. With his wife Sapphira, her name means beautiful. So God is good and beautiful, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. So same thing, right? Same thing. This couple in the church probably saw what Barnabas did and wanted some of that also. Or, I don't know, maybe it was a crazy campaign that Pastor Peter came up with. I don't know. But for whatever reason, here is this couple. They do the same thing that we see Barnabas do, which doesn't sound all that bad, right? They, they saw something. They liked it. They were inspired by it. But the Bible says that this time, Ananias and Sapphira didn't give all the money to the church. This time, they just kept back a couple thousand dollars for themselves, right? Because, you know, that's a lot of money, and we were really hoping to buy a pair of jet skis this year, which doesn't sound bad. It's their house to begin with. It's their property to begin with, and if it were you, and you sold your house here in Walden for $200,000, and you wanted to keep $50,000 for yourself, and you gave the rest of it to Walden Church, you wouldn't hear anyone around here complaining. But Pastor Peter has a different response. And keep reading. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Can you imagine? You give this nice big check to the church, and the pastor, instead of thanking you, says, Satan has filled your heart. <laughs> Yikes, what is wrong with Peter? Why is he so ungrateful? There must be something more going on here, right? But Peter doesn't say that he is mad or that the church is mad. Peter says, you have not lied to me. You've lied to God. Ananias and Sapphira promised God. They said they would give all of it. The image they were trying to portray was that same image of Barnabas. They wanted to be able to show off, to say, look, we are also people of sacrifice. We are also generous people. Perhaps they wanted that same praise. They wanted that same affirmation. Maybe they wanted to be recognized for something that they were not. That might fool the people around you. But God sees beneath our mask. He sees the real us. He knows us. The people around us, they see what's on the outside, but God sees what's in the heart. Ananias 
and Sapphira were liars. Okay, but lying is not that bad. You know, that's why we, that's why we say it's a little white lie. It's, it's selective truth-telling. You know, it's a sin, but it's a, it's a sin with a small s. I mean, it's not like rape or murder. I don't abuse children or steal cars. Those are the really bad people in the world. Tell me something. Is lying bad? God thought it was bad enough to put in the Ten Commandments. It's top ten bad. That seems like it's pretty bad to me. Why do you think that is? Lying is dishonest. It's not genuine. It's pretending that you are some way that you're not. You're presenting yourself, you're presenting your behavior as something that you are not. What happens when you lie on your taxes? Could you get fined? Could you go to jail? What happens if they find out that you lied on your resume? You could get fired. Okay, but that's not the same. That's not the same thing as when my neighbor comes up to me and he says, hey, did you watch the, did you watch the most recent episode of, of 90 Day Fiance last night? And you say, oh, no, I, I don't watch a lot of TV. I, I'm not really a TV person. But you totally know that you watched it. Okay, so what's wrong with that? Ephesians 4 says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Paul says, give no opportunity. Some translations say foothold because you allow darkness to get its foot in the door of your life. You allow evil, even if it's just a crack, and you're right, lying about what TV shows that you watch might not be that bad, but it's a gateway sin. You're presenting yourself as fiction. You're beginning to pick up the mask. You're beginning to pretend that you're something that you're not, becoming a hypocrite. And as people who are saints, as people who are disciples of God, we should be people of truth and people of integrity. Solomon says, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. He says, better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. King Solomon says, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. Of course we should act good, right? We should act right. We should. We should give generously to the church, but we should act good because we are good. The actions should flow from who we are, legitimately, on the inside, not because of who we want people to think we are. Ananias and Sapphira want to look good, they want to be identified as good people. They want to be filled with the Spirit, but they don't actually want to be good. They wanted to look like saints. They wanted the praise and honor of being saints, but they wanted to stay the same on the inside. That's a hypocrite. That's a hypocrite. Listen to how John MacArthur says it. God's desire for his children here on earth is purity of life. It is impossible to study scripture attentively and not be overwhelmingly convinced that God seeks above all else for his people to be holy and that he is grieved by sin of any kind because God is so concerned for the holiness of his people, they should be equally concerned. The church cannot preach and teach a message it does not live and have any integrity before God or even before the world. Yet in many churches where there is no tolerance for sin in principle, there is much tolerance for it in practice. And when preaching becomes separated from living, it becomes separated both from integrity and from spiritual 
and moral effectiveness. It promotes hypocrisy instead of holiness. Hypocrisy instead of holiness. Hypocrisy instead of sainthood. Let's grab some advice. Let's grab some advice. What can we do? 1 Peter 1. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Peter has been talking about the hope that is given to Christians. Because Christ is raised from the dead, then we know that will happen. We know that God will raise up us as well. Because we are all part of God's kingdom, we are heirs, right? And so it's because of that hope, he says, that calls us to live a life of holiness, We are to live holy lives because of what lies ahead for us. Christ is coming back for us. And so his argument is that should motivate you. That should motivate you for holiness. That should motivate you for sainthood. Why? Because the person who knows that something amazing is waiting for them at the end of the road, they will be more careful to behave properly as they walk along the road. And when Peter says, be holy for I am holy, he is quoting Leviticus 11, which means Old Testament and New Testament theology agree, right? This is not a new thing. We are to live holy lives just as God is holy. You see, God has the right to expect and demand holiness from us because he is holy. So that would maybe ask the question, well, what is holiness? What does it really mean for us to be holy? Because the word holy, like saint, simply means to be set apart for a special purpose. A lot of things in the Bible are holy. A lot of inanimate objects are holy. There's mountains like Sinai and Zion, the Mount of Transfiguration. Those are all holy mountains in the Bible. Oil that's sometimes used, was called holy oil. The temple was called the holy temple. Its rooms were called the holy place and the most holy place. And even some of the furniture items were called holy. Sometimes the very place where someone is standing in the Bible becomes holy ground. The city of Jerusalem was the holy city. Certain days we call holy days. But more often in scripture, it's the people. It's the people who are called holy. And I want to impress upon you this morning this idea that the word holy has to do with God and his presence working in your life. And that's the place to begin when we try to understand what it means to be a saint. John 1.14 says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. The heavens declare the glory of God. But when God wanted to reveal himself to humanity, when God wanted to show off his character and all the beauty of his holiness, his love, his mercy, God manifested himself as the person Jesus. Our holy God took on the form of the person Jesus Christ. And in Christ, we see all the holiness of God as purely and as completely a human life could be. That's the name of the meaning, Emmanuel. That's what that name means, God with us. He was here in flesh. You could could see him. You could hear his voice. You could touch him. God was right there in physical form just like other people around him. And you could ask him questions, you could listen to him preach, you could worship him face to face, but you could also hate him. You could make fun of him. You could slap him, you could spit him. 
uh, right in the face. You could put a crown of thorns on his head and you could nail him to a cross and you could watch him die. And that's what the world did, wasn't it? But the rejection of him doesn't change the fact that for a moment in time, for a split second in history, God came so close. Wouldn't it have been great to be there, to have seen it? It would have been so great to listen to him, just like how Peter and John listened. It would have been so great to touch the hem of his garment like the woman touched him and, and was healed. If we could only wash his feet like Mary or, or have him over for dinner like Zacchaeus. The disciples became saints. Palestine became a holy land. All because Jesus had come close. Because when God comes close, the things that are touched, the things that are affected, become holy. When God comes close, something becomes holy. Now, there is no tabernacle, right? Now, today, there is no temple. That, the time where something became holy because we said so, that, that, that time has passed. And, and this time, when things are holy, it's because God came close. God now comes close to you. He comes close to your body. And now my body becomes the holiest place on the face of the earth. At this very moment, it is within your body where God lives. Our bodies are now God's temple. And they are now holy because of his presence. When God comes close, something becomes holy. This time, that something is, is you and me. We are holy. We are holy and we are called to be saints. That's important for us to remember. Sometimes we lose our focus. And you know, some Christians, for example, that we see this building as, as a place that's holy. And we say things like, I can't believe she wore that to church today. Or, you know, I'm not gonna tell that joke in church. We can wait till we get out in the parking lot to tell that joke. I can't believe that guy swore in church. I can't believe that guy wore a hat in church. What would you think if somebody next to you in church just lit up a cigar and started smoking? Why are we so concerned about what we do in this building more than we are concerned with what we do with our body. It is our body that is holy, not this building. If you tell that joke, you can tell it anywhere. You can tell it in God's house, or you can tell it at your house. Because wherever you go, that's where God lives. If you wear that skirt anywhere, then you have worn it to decorate God's church with. To commit a sin in a church building, no matter how disgusting or how inappropriate, would be no worse than committing that sin anywhere else. The church building is not holy. It's just brick, it's mortar, it's wood, it's nails. Paul reminds you, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Why are we saints? Because when God comes near, something becomes holy. And God dwells within you. And let me say this. If knowing that fact doesn't make a difference in the way you live, I don't know what will. Ruth Bell Graham said, a saint is one who makes it easy to believe in Jesus. I like that. Because what she's saying is it comes out in the way you live, in honesty, integrity. It's authentic because that's the real you. I know it's hard to think of yourself as being a saint. 
But saints are just ordinary people who love God, who follow Jesus. And God's always worked like this. He takes ordinary people and then he uses them for a holy purpose. Sometimes God calls them to speak a word or perform a deed. Sometimes they deliver a message. Other times they're given a life's work. But saints are just ordinary people. Ordinary people who have listened to God's call and who've said, yes, I will do that. Well, typically they've said, I think you've got the wrong guy. And then they've said, yes, I will do that. And because we are saints, and because God lives within us, that means there needs to be something different about the way we live. Something different about the way we speak. Something different about the way we act. Something different about the way we raise our children. Holiness means letting Christ rule our life doing what he wants us to do. And it means we make every effort to get rid of deception, hypocrisy, duality, and we strive to take on the qualities that are more like God. Qualities like what? Galatians 5.2 is good. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. See, Ananias and Sapphira, they wanted to be special. Just like the Pharisees, they want the appearance of holiness, the appearance of being a saint. But you and I will never be special because of who we are. We're only special because of who God is. Because when God comes near, things become holy. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful for the holy saints that have come before us, for this church that's paved the way through the centuries to lead us where we are now today. May your church continue to be a kingdom of truth, of righteousness, of honesty, of integrity, in a world that's full of deceit, in a world that's filled with lies and rumor and gossip. Lord, may we be different. May your church be different. May Christians around the world be different. Lord, I don't want to be a liar. I don't want to spread rumor. I don't want to spread conspiracy. I don't want to hear something and whisper it in the ear of someone else before I check to see if it's true. Lies and deceit and duality and hypocrisy should stop dead in their tracks at the foot of your church. May your church be a place of transparency, openness, love, acceptance, with no hidden inner desire to present ourselves as something that we are not. We don't have to be the biggest church on the street, the flashiest. We don't have to boast that we have the best preaching or the best music or the best congregation. We are only best because you are best. We are only holy because you are holy. We are only good because you came near. Thank you, Lord, for your touch. Thank you, Lord, for your work in our lives. And when we go from this place, may we be reminded that it is not this place that makes us holy. It is not this building that makes us Christian. It is the fact that you live inside of us and that wherever we go, your temple goes. May we live lives of integrity and openness and truth because you are truth. In Christ's name, amen. 
Hey, thanks for watching this morning. Uh, if you've liked this message, please do us a favor, give this video a like, subscribe to our channel. That helps other people find these messages. You can also clip and copy the URL, the address up at the top. You can post it to your own page, your own social media, or post it to uh, a friend's page who you think might be encouraged from these words today. I love you guys. We'll see you next time. Bye.